Do you recall the English uh, nursing rhyme, uh, ring around the roses, pocket full of posies, ashes, ashes, we all fall down? They, they tell us that that rhyme originated in the Black Plague in the 1300s, uh, called the Bubonic Plague in Great Britain, or the Black Death, because you turned black and in a couple of days you died. And, and, and this plague uh, affected uh, Europe and especially uh, Great Britain for 50 years. It would come and it would go. Nobody really knows for sure how many people died, but they say 30 to 60 percent of the whole population of Great Britain died. It was so bad that some little villages had no one left to bury the dead. And, and, and they thought that what caused that was the pollution in the air. And, and so they tell us that the origins of this rhyme were uh, that the fragrances of the roses and of the posies could ward off the plague. You just toss them up in the air. But if they didn't work, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. We would all die. Now, today we know through a, a science that that was really a bacterial plague caused by the bite of rats and fleas. But in those days, the people were clueless. Without accurate information and a proper diagnosis, it's easy to be fooled or misled or misinformed. One of the most difficult questions that we face is to distinguish between the true and the false, the authentic and the faith. And that's exactly what Paul is trying to deal with here with the Galatians in this section of his epistle. So Paul wants to set the record straight. Someone has been misleading you. You have been tricked. So he starts with a question. He, he writes in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, these words. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? Foolish. In, in, in the Greek, it's unthinkable what you have done. You are de destitute of thought. Calvin translated the word madness. Luther said, you're insane. You're being stupid, thoughtless. You're not thinking. You're not using your mind. Question, who has bewitched you? Who, who has cast a spell over you? You're in a trance. Uh, you're being misled, and the only possible explanation that I can have is that someone has tricked you. You are being deceived. Someone is charming you. And, and, and you're being tricked and misled from someone who was publicly portrayed as crucified. I taught you that Jesus was publicly per portrayed as crucified. I, I was clear. I was concise in my message. You grasped the truth. You understood the truth of my message. You should be the last people who are deceived or led away. Why would you fall away? I mean, if I, Paul, the apostle of the apostles, taught it, how easily then it is for anyone to be misled or fall away, because you heard it directly from me, and still you fall away. And I, and I think, man, if, if they heard it from Paul and fell away, how easily we could be deceived, how susceptible we are to false information. So he says, who bewitched you? You've gone astray. You've been tricked. And he knows that ultimately this kind of deception comes from the devil himself. He is the deceiver, the teacher of lies. So Paul is saying, be careful of the fake. And you, you know what's uh, significant about the fake? That the fake that the devil gives is, is falsehood that almost seems true. It tricks us and deceives us. He has another question he wants to ask the uh, Galatians. He writes in verse 2 of chapter 3, let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish that having begun with the Spirit, you are now ending with the flesh? Uh, the question is clear. It's a simple one. There's only one thing I need to know. Did you receive the Spirit by what you did, by observing the ceremonial and dietary laws, or did you receive it by faith? I mean, think for a moment. Just look back in time to when you received the Holy Spirit. How did that happen? Did you earn it? Did you deserve it? Was it because of something you did, or was it because of your hearing and believing of the gospel? Do you remember Pentecost, Paul's saying to them? Remember what happened there? Peter preached the gospel. The message was received, and the people received the Holy Spirit. Now, did they receive that Holy Spirit because they kept the law? the ceremonial laws, the oral laws, the dietary laws? Did they receive the Holy Spirit because they were circumcised? 
Was it anything that they did? Of course not. Now, if you didn't start there uh, with works, why would you want to end there with works, by what you do to be good or right or to justify your own position before God? Why would you start by doing rather than by receiving in faith? You remember Lazarus was dead in the tomb uh, for three full days. He didn't come out. He was rotting. He was dying. Do you think that Lazarus was freed from that tomb and came out from that tomb by himself on the basis of what he did? Or was it that he received the Holy Spirit as it was sent into him through Jesus Christ and his body came back to life again? Ezekiel uh, in the uh, captivity in the banks of the river Kivar in Babylon. And he has this vision of the valley of the dry bones, all of these bones, whitewashed bones scattered in the valley. And, and, and God put those bones together and knit them together, but they were not alive yet until God breathed his, breathed his spirit, his ruach into them. And then they came to life. How do you think that happened? Was it something that the bones did themselves or did they receive the word of God and receive the spirit of God? So why would you start with the spirit and end up with works? Why would you start one way and live another? Paul knows that it's so easy to be fooled and, and misled. The deception is a slippery slope. You start at the top on the sled very slowly and it gains momentum until it's out of control and there's going to be a train wreck at the bottom. Uh, deception, being tricked, being misled, ha happens very slowly. It's a slow erosion over time. No garden ever grew uh, uh, overnight and, and, and no erosion ever happened in an instant. It just takes time. It's, it's like the frog in the kettle that slowly boils to death. And, and Paul is saying here, you're in hot water. You're on a slippery slope. You're being misled. You're headed in the wrong direction. Very slowly, this erosion is taking place, but it will end up in a disaster. So pluck it out, stomp it out, Stop it right now. He wants to talk to them about deception and about counterfeit Christianity. Now, I want to talk to you about some tough concepts today. I mean, these are, these are tough and, and, and they get extremely personal. I want to talk to you about counterfeit Christianity, what ways that we get deceived suddenly, slowly. I want to talk about distortions of the truth amongst believers. And, and the first area, and again, this is tough stuff, uh, but the first area that I want to talk about is the lie of legalism. Legalism says that we can please God and change our nature and find inner peace and go to heaven on the basis of what we do. It is the most widely held misconception of Christianity. It's a falsehood. Now, here's where it gets a little tough. Who do you think is the modern-day equivalent of the Judaizers in our modern day church. Well, I'm going to suggest to you that it's the Roman Catholic Church, and I, I know many of you have come from that background, so I want to be careful here, and I want to speak to you in grace, in truth, and in love. And there are some things you might not be aware of. The prevailing teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, not necessarily in your local parish. I have Catholic priests who are Christ-loving people and good personal friends. But, but if you go back to the books and the documents that, that are written, the, the doctrinal statements, you will find that the teachings are that the Pope is infallible. He can speak ex cathedra on behalf of God. That, that the Catholic Church teaches that confession of sins comes through an intermediary, through a priest. It teaches that we are saved and regenerated by baptism alone. It teaches that communion, in the communion, the elements of the bread and the wine are changed into the actual body and the blood of Jesus, that we're actually partaking and eating of the body of Jesus and drinking of his blood. It, it teaches that Mary is a mediator, that she makes intercessory prayers to Jesus on our behalf. It, it teaches in certain rituals like rosaries and uh, uh, repetitive prayer, our fathers and Hail Marys that, that do something to gain special status before God. And, and especially at the heart of the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church, as it's written in the books from the Middle Ages, is that faith alone is not enough for our salvation, but we must add to it. 
one of the teachings of the Catholic Church that I've been fascinated with over the years is what they call works of super erogation. It sounds like works of irrigation. It's super erogation. And, and what this is, is that we can do works or be, be good beyond or above what God really requires. For, for instance, in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says it's better not to be married. It's better to be celibate. Uh, now, that's not a requirement of salvation or sanctification, but, but if you follow in that direction, you're, you're actually performing above and beyond our moral duty before God, so we get extra credit for, for doing that, for, for uh, being celibate. And, and what happens over time is that we have more merit than we really need, more good works inside of us than we really need to get to heaven. So the question becomes, what do you do with all of those extra good works that we have inside of us? And that's the concept of the treasury of merit, which leads us to indulgences. That, that, that if I have so many good works, I'm a saint in the church, and, and, and way above and beyond my moral duty and obligation before God, uh, I've more than fulfilled my duties and rules and regulations and the standards that he's given me. So I can take that extra good works and I can put them in a treasury chest, a treasure chest of, of good works uh, before God. And, and, and where this got to be a really difficult issue is in the 1500s, early 1500s, there was a monk in uh, Wittenberg, Germany by the name of Martin Luther, and the Pope was sending his emissaries uh, up to Germany to uh, get money from the poor people, from the peasants, and, and he, they would bring the treasury of merit into a town, and, and they would say, you know, your, your mother, or your father, or your grandmother, or your grandfather, or if you, a child uh, had died, they're lost somewhere in purgatory, they're, they're, they're crying out for your help. Uh, we can give them extra merits. You can purchase these merits out of the treasury, and we can, I'll give you a little piece of paper, and we can apply those to these people, to your ancestors who have already died, who are begging and crying for your help this very moment. And so they would sell these indulgences to build primarily St. Peter's Church in, in Rome. Well, this, this is Pope Leo X. Well, this little monk thought that was not such a good idea for his little parish there, the Castle Church in Wittenberg. So uh, one day, uh, October 31st, he took the 95 reasons why he didn't believe in indulgences and why the people of his parish shouldn't purchase these indulgences. And he nailed them on the door, the front door of the church, so that they would have to read these 95 reasons why they were being misled with a counterfeit Christianity by Pope Leo X. And of course, uh, somebody copied those down. They got them to Gutenberg. He printed them and they spread all throughout uh, Germany and then throughout Europe. And it really ruined the Pope's fundraising plan. So Luther got into very deep hot water with the Pope. Now ultimately, Luther worked out this concept of justification by faith alone and he became one of the first Protestants. What is a Protestant? It is a protester against the doctrines of Rome at that time in the early 1500s. And so those of us that are Protestants, uh, we have made a clear-cut distinction between Protestants and the Roman Catholic Church and its teachings. And, and, and again, I don't want to be uh, without grace. It doesn't mean that Catholics are bad people. They're not. They're very good people. Uh, but they have been misled and tricked in some of these fundamental teachings of the faith. Well, not only is legalism things that we do to gain favor before God, treasuries of merit, uh, not only is that one way that we can be deceived, but there's a second way we can be tricked and fooled, and that's what I call asceticism. Asceticism. It is seeking a holy life. It is a life of, of self-denial. Now, again, there are a lot of good things uh, in these concepts, and, and there are a lot of good people, but they're almost truth, but not really truth. It's a, it's a way of being misled. If you look back into 350 uh, AD, there was a man by the name of Anthony who lived in Egypt. Uh, his parents died when he was 20 years old, and he decided to follow Matthew 19.21. It's the story of the rich young ruler, and Jesus is trying to convince him there's nothing that he can do to come into heaven, but he has to trust by Jesus in faith. And, and finally, Jesus says to him, to wrap up this argument, if you want to be perfect, go sell everything that you have and give it to the poor and follow me. And, and the rich young ruler walked away destitute. Of course, I can't, cannot do that. And, and the last phrase of that, that Jesus tells him is, if you would do all that, and if you could do all that, you'd have treasures in heaven. Well, Anthony read that, and he decided to become the first monk, a hermit. He lived in tombs. Uh, he had a strict diet of water and salt and bread. And when he was 35 years, he finally 
totally withdrew from society and lived a life of solitude and isolation and fasting and self-denial, trying to purge himself from his human desires. He was so isolated that they threw food at him over a wall. And what's interesting is that when he did die, a whole colony of people were fascinated by this concept of a monastic life. And so they started the first monastery right outside the walls of where he died. Now, another person that I've really been fascinated with, I remember early on reading about this guy. In 459, there's a fellow by the name of Simeon of Stylitis. Stylitis is a city in Turkey, in Syria. And when he was 13 years old, uh, yeah, he decided to go to a monastery. He, he, was, he gave his life to Jesus. And, and by the time he was 16, he lived a full life of austerity to get away from people. And, and what he did is to, to isolate himself and to get away from people and to purge human desires inside of him. They tell us, as best as we can tell, that he built a platform three feet by three feet, and the ele then he elevated on a pole 50 feet high. He climbed the pole, and he lived there the rest of his life for 37 years on a three-foot by three-foot platform. And when he died, he actually inspired imitators to follow him by living their lives on a platform to be holy enough or good enough to seek or find God's favor. Well, of course, all of these attempts at uh, self-discipline sound good, and these are good people and they're good principles, and God wants us to strive for holiness in our lives and sanctification in our lives. But ultimately, if it's something that we're trying to do, we fail in our efforts because only God can change the human heart. So we open ourselves up to the Holy Spirit. You know, we, we just open up and we receive. Our hearts don't get cold and shriveled and isolated, but they get open and available and usable by Him. He brings us new life. Uh, this asceticism, along with legalism, were, were attempts uh, at truth, but they were merely an illusion of truth. They were counterfeit. They were The people are being misled by them. It's falsehood. It's fake Christianity. It's not what Jesus had in mind. So there's the lie of legalism, and there's the striving of asceticism. And there's a third way that I think it's easy to be misled, counterfeit Christianity, falsehoods. And that is the attempts at Christian mysticism. Uh, mysticism is uh, mystery, uh, events or insights that are beyond the realm of Scripture. They're, they're mystical by nature. They're internal experiences that go beyond what God says is true. One of the areas of Christian mysticism that's uh, fascinated me is the use of relics. Uh, uh, people attach certain powers to things or objects or bones or wood, and they're called relics. They're housed in uh, reliquaries. Uh, there's a church in Pittsburgh that I used to visit up on Mount Troy that's, I believe, it's the largest uh, collection of reliquaries and relics in America today. And if you go into that church, you can see a bone from Peter, and you can see a piece of the cross, and a crown from the thorns of Jesus. And, and, and these objects are venerated in their reliquaries. And, and, and people believe they have special healing powers to them, and certain powers of vision and experiences of God. In, in Lourdes, France, in 1858, uh, there was the appearance of the Virgin Mary to a village girl. And uh, people now go there in mass to bathe and drink of the waters of the healing of Lourdes. In Medjugorje, Bosnia, you probably know this story or are aware of that. There was an appearance of the Virgin Mary to some young teenagers. And today we have over one million pilgrims a year that go there to find some kind of healing or a spiritual experience. Now, nowhere in Scripture do we find any kind of sense of apparitions or a teaching about relics or necromancy, you know, some kind of experience of those in the life who died who have come back from the dead. Of course, Mary doesn't appear anywhere today. She was a human being. Of course, those relics at Mount Troy have no power to them. If we gathered up all the relics of the bones of Peter, we'd have enough for probably a hundred Peters today. We don't seek after spiritual experiences in those kinds of things to get us closer to God. Yet millions of people are led astray and fall into those counterfeit beliefs. What we're saying here with spiritual mysticism is be careful of superstition. 
Christian spiritual superstition that crowds into our lives without us knowing it. And that can be from rosary beads to apparitions uh, to crazy ascetical acts trying to get us into a special position of standing or favor before God. Years ago, I was traveling as a teacher for evangelism explosion through South America, and we were staying in third world countries, uh, Bolivia, Colombia, Peru, uh, Ecuador. And finally, in the last days of our trip, we ended up in Santiago, Chile, Chile. And uh, we were staying in a Sheraton Inn, the first time we'd stayed in a really nice place. And, and one afternoon, I had the opportunity, it was free, I had uh, free time, I had the opportunity to go up to the top floor where there was a swimming pool. And I couldn't wait to get up there and just uh, get onto a lounge chair, relax, soak in the rays, and uh, get some rest from this grueling trip. The travel arrangements were just uh, overwhelming to me. So I took the elevator and I got up, I had my tile. And I got up there, and all the lounge chairs were taken by these enormous human beings by the time that I got there. So I had to roll out my towel on the concrete near the pool and, I, and, and just laid there. And, and I could hear these men talking, and they were enormous, and, and they were speaking English. They were from America, and they were telling jokes and uh, swearing and cussing dirty jokes. And they were having the time of their lives. And finally, one of the fellows looked down at me, and he said, uh, so uh, who are you? And I said, well, I'm Amer an American, too. He said, well, what do you do? And I, I said, I'm an Anglican Episcopal priest. And, and I could see immediately that his mind went on rewind of all all the things that they had been saying and cussing and swearing and telling these jokes. And, and I could tell that he was struggling to say something religious to me, uh, to, to make some kind of contact. So, so he said, well, oh, oh, well, I, uh, I cross myself when I shoot foul shots. And I said, oh, that's, that's, that's wonderful. Now, uh, here's my thinking, that this is a superstition. It's like a, a lucky rabbit's foot. You, you know, I do something that looks good to God, so God does something for me. I make the foul shot. That's superstition, that kind of crossing. And I, I know when I was in high school, all the kids, all the basketball players crossed themselves before they shoot a foul shot, as if God was going to make that ball go through the hoop. Let me close by making some practical insights in how we recognize and guard against the counterfeit in our lives, that which is fake rather than that which is true. So let me give you some principles here, just five quick principles. I wanna I want wrap this up and we can talk about this more in, in another message. It really deserves uh, more time, but I, I want you to under, understand how to protect yourself from that slippery slope. First of all, the most uh, false counterfeit religions and, and views of Christianity are built on an isolated passage of scripture that is taken out of context, an isolated passage of scripture that's taken out of con context. Now remember, we've been saying in Galatians that scripture, scripture interprets scripture, that the epistles interpret the gospels and the book of Acts. We don't interpret scripture. God interprets it for us. That's why we believe that the scriptures are inspired, infallible, inerrant, Word of God in their original autographs or in their original manuscripts. So we try to take a systematic approach to the Bible. It's called a, a plenary approach to the Bible. How do all the pieces fit together so that we don't take an isolated passage of Scripture and interpret it out of context? It, everything has to fit together in the Bible and make sense from the start to the finish. It's plenary. It's inspired in all of its aspects. The second one is this, an inaccurate interpretation of Scripture. This is called hermeneutics. It's how we study the Bible. It is the principles, the hermeneutical principles of the interpretation of Scripture. Now, let me give you uh, some uh, principles that you can use. First of all, every text must be identified by the kind of text that it really is. Is it literary? Is it historical? Is it poetry? Is it wisdom? Is it allegory? Is it prophetic? When the Bible says the mountains cry out, that's an allegory. That's a poetic 
form of saying the mountains aren't really crying out, but it's expressing a concept here that the mountains are so happy, that the world is so happy, that God is happy. So, so we must identify the kind of scripture. Secondly, consider the context. Who, what, where, why, how is this being written? The context is extremely important. Third, read the plain meaning of the text. Don't read other things that may serve our own purposes or our, our own feelings. Four, determine the writer's intent. Not my intent, not what do I want to get out of it, but what was Paul really trying to say here? What was Ezekiel trying to say here? What was Isaiah trying to say? What is John trying to say here? What is the original intent, intent of the writer? And finally, look at the language itself. Understand the language. That's why in consequential Christianity, we like to understand the Greek words and the Hebrew words. They're critical. They're important. And, and make a difference between a translation and a paraphrase. A paraphrase of, of the Bible is paraphrasing a translation. So it's one other step removed from the actual Greek and the actual Hebrew. And, 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 and so it may be good, it may be easy to understand, but it's a paraphrase. It's not something we really want to study. Well, not only do we make sure that uh, our belief system is not built on a single passage of Scripture taken out of context, or that we have an interact, inaccurate uh, translation of the scriptures. But, but three, uh, watch out for anything that replaces the Spirit of God and the relationship with God with a set of rules that, that gives the appearance, appearance of discipline and perfectionism, but is really substituting rules. And, and in the case of the Judaizers, it, it was the oral and ceremonial and dietary laws with a relationship with Jesus. Uh, because none of that really deals with the problems of sin and who we are as people inside. Uh, it, it substitutes uh, justification by faith, by justification by what we do in our lives, and sanctification by what we do. Now, what we do is important, but, but it all comes through the reception and the receiving of the Holy Spirit. Four, be careful of anything that alienates and isolates people from their family or their friends or their community or their culture or their world. Reservationist monastic theology is not a theology that allows us to be, as believers, to be on the offensive with our faith. It withdraws us from the world. It withdraws us from the fight. It puts us behind walls, and we keep Christianity preserved and reserved merely for Christians. So be careful of anything that doesn't have an outward focus to it, that reaches out. And finally, number five, uh, be careful of anything that majors in the minors, and primarily that's built on our own felt needs. So Paul says, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has deceived you? Who has bewitched you? Before whom eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Stick with the gospel message. Don't major in the minors. Now, re remember the points that I've shared with you. Uh, be careful of that which is built on an isolated passage of Scripture. It's taken out of context. Be careful of inaccurate interpretations of Scripture. Be careful of, of replacing the Spirit of God in a relationship with God with a set of rules and regulations and duties and obligations. Be careful of anything that isolates us from our family, our friends, our culture, and our world, and be careful of majoring in the minors, and, and oftentimes that's built on personal need. Why have I gone through all of this? Because, because if Paul taught the Galatians, and they were easily fooled and tricked and misled, imagine how easy it is for you and I to be fooled and tricked and misled. And I could go through a whole other set of various methodologies or beliefs that just mislead believers. Stick with the truth. That has that has what J.B. Phillips said, has a ring of truth around it. Get a discernment that, uh, of being able to tell the fake from the real, the authentic from that which is false. Seek after truth and let God then build inside of us through his Holy Spirit healthy human beings in healthy relationships and in healthy relationship with our world that has an outward focus to it of defending our faith. And that's where God wants us to be. We live in troubled times. He does not want us to live behind walls. He does not want us to get isolated into our own selves, into our own inner being. He wants us to take the offensive and have the tools to be able to go out there and fight the good fight. And that's what consequential Christianity is all about, helping us to understand all of life from God's perspective. And so, Lord, may we not be fooled, may we not be tricked or misled or bewitched, but may we know the truth. 
May our truth source be in your Holy Scriptures. And, and may we strive and thrive after a filling of the Holy Spirit and a vital relationship with a living, loving God.